Is it like? Um, thanks for hosting us. Um, my name is Catherine Medlock, and I am the East Tennessee Program Director for the Tennessee Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And uh, it's my pleasure to um, to introduce um, Josh Kelly and um, and the um, what he's calling EcoMath 2.0 um, for um, uh, for you all to um, to hear about. Um, this process is really um, uh, based uh, largely on um, participation by a number of folks, um, many of them um, members of the um, Cherokee National Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative um, and members of um, the Southern Blue Ridge Fire Learning Network. Um, the the process um, was um, was largely funded by the um, by the Cherokee National Forest, and um, we're appreciative to them for for that. And I'm excited to um, to share with you all what we've done. Um, many of you may be familiar with the original EcoMath work that Josh did, and um, with other FLN landscapes in the Southern Blue Ridge and um, our endeavor here was to to look at the landscape um, without the boundaries of existing burn units. Um, so to look at the entire landscape using um, a similar process that was used in, in previous um, EcoMath work. So um, and Josh is the um, is the brains and the driver behind this thing. Um, with and, and he's with um, with an organization called Mountain True out of North Car Western North Carolina. And um, so without that, without, without further ado, I'm going to turn that over to, turn things over to Josh. Um, and hopefully I didn't forget anything. And if I did, Josh will, Josh will remind me or, or say, them him, say these things himself if he needs to. <laughs> well, thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Liz and Margaret, for uh, organizing this webinar. And thanks for all who are attending. Um, some of you may uh, have seen previous versions of this or, uh, or similar presentations that I've done over the past few years. Uh, I hope this is uh, still entertaining for you if you have seen it before. Um, and uh, special thanks to Cherokee National Forest and uh, the Nature Conservancy and especially Catherine Medlock for all the work they did to organize uh, the group that came up with the framework for this project. Um, and so um, th this project builds on previous work that was, has been done in the, in the Southern Blue Ridge FO, and there have been several versions of EcoMath on, on several different landscapes. Um, the first one started out in the Grandfather Ranger District. And, um, and so it, basically EcoMath is a, a prioritization scheme um, to prioritize fire based on ecological need. And, and you know, why do we prioritize? It's pretty obvious. It's because we can't do everything we want to do, so we have to we have to pick out the, the cream of the crop. And um, we've got this situation in the eastern U.S. and over most of North America at this point uh, where we have at least decades of fire suppression um, and a seclusion that are altering ecosystems that depend on fire. Um, and the, the goal of EcoMath is to focus implementation on ecological need rather than on convenience. And in uh, public land in the southern Blue Ridge, we have a lot of very moist natural communities that uh, don't burn very frequently naturally and uh, put out fires pretty well. And it's, it's pretty easy to just put a bunch of that stuff inside of a, a potential prescribed fire unit and uh, have very little risk and have, a, have the fire unit contained by strong containment lines and, and call it a day and, and count those acres. And th there's uh, certainly some value to, to burning some of the more moist places at times, but in general, um, a lot of the places that need to burn the most are the places that historically burn the most frequently. And sometimes those places can also be a little inconvenient to burn. Um, there's also, uh, in the public perception realm, there are concerns about consequences from fire as well as benefits from fire. And when fire is prioritized based on ecological need, I think there's a stronger case that fire is doing, uh, is helping the ecosystem rather than harming it. So all of the uh, Southern Blue Ridge Fire Learning Network uh, EcoMath schemes, uh, use, ha they have some, some commonalities. Uh, they generally focus on vegetation types because we have such good vegetation mapping in the Southern Blue Ridge FLN. 
um, and basically looking at other factors in addition to vegetation types that are important to conservation stakeholders, um, including special habitats, rare communities, rare species, et cetera. Um, and then making the choice uh, of how to weight those different factors in, in the prioritization scheme is always important and um, not necessarily objective. Uh, and neither, for that matter, is conservation. You know, we conserve what we care about. Uh, our conservation is based on human values. And the fact that we, we care about rare species at all is, is somewhat of a, um, of a human artifact. In the, the first um, ECOMAS um, prioritization on the Grandfather Ranger District, we looked at, at all those things I mentioned. We looked at uh, particularly pine forest and oak forest, because pine and oak forest have such strong scientific evidence that uh, fire is important to them. And we looked at things like uh, openings, uh, permanent openings that are managed for wildlife habitat. Uh, we looked at uh, other conservation lands. We looked at uh, natural heritage areas uh, and rare species habitat. And then uh, scored those different things uh, on the individual unit level. And this is a look at the Boone Fork uh, unit with the pine and oak forest in yellow and red and uh, a light purple for a state natural heritage area and some dark purple for other state lands, et cetera, uh, national forest and darker green. Um, and then we, we did that process for about 90 units, I think, across the, the entire uh, 90 prescribed fire units across the landscape, which was a very valuable tool. There were uh, not, there's not the capacity to actually uh, burn all of these prescribed fire units on a meaningful rotation. And so uh, choosing the highest scoring units uh, I think will allow uh, the Grandfather Ranger District and the escarpment FLN to, do, uh, to get the most bang for their buck. What this scheme didn't do was look at the entire landscape. It just looked at those prescribed fire units. And um, so this, this new process with Cherokee National Forest is, is, is looking at things a little different. And Cherokee National Forest is in a different place than the Nantahala Pisgah National Forest is. Uh, Cherokee National Forest was one of the first forests, if not the for first forest in the southern uh, Appalachians to start uh, really increasing the management they did with prescribed fire starting in about 1998. Um, and Cherokee National Forest uh, is right on the North Carolina Tennessee line in East Tennessee, and it's broken up by uh, Smoky Mountains National Park. And um, this analysis is specific to the north zone of Cherokee National Forest, which is about half of their acreage. It's about 340,000 acres. And so all the, all the area south of uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park was not evaluated because that area did not at the time have high quality vegetation mapping like the north zone did. Um, so, um, Ever since about 1998, uh, the Cherokee National Forest has really been increasing their prescribed fire. By the mid-2000s, uh, the North Zone was averaging at least uh, five to 10,000 acres annually. Um, and there are about 120,000 acres inside of controlled burn units that have been, most of them have been burned at this point on Cherokee National Forest. Not all of them, but most of them. And so the, the Cherokee National Forest is at a place where some of those burn units are getting into a desired condition and they're able to focus on new areas. And so the intent of this uh, prioritization scheme was to look at the entire forest and not just what was already inside of uh, prescribed fire units. Um, so again, I, I mentioned that Cherokee National Forest probably has the most established prescribed fire program in the Southern Appalachians and they had ecological zone maps that were um, completed in 2011 um, and that we are gonna go beyond the, the boundaries of the existing prescribed fire units. Now the ecological zone mapping uh, is probably the GIS data set that this analysis leans the heaviest on. And uh, ecological zone mapping uh, is a product uh, that's created by a retired Forest Service ecologist by the name of Steve Simone, who worked for years in Nantahala Pisgah, and has mapped many areas of the Southern Appalachians at this point. And, um, Ecological zones are based on potential natural vegetation. It's not necessarily what's actually there, but it's what's predicted to be there. And uh, the model is trained by making plots of existing vegetation. So in this uh, photo, Steve is mapping out heath bulbs from a distance with his, you know, with his arc map open and putting points on each of those heath bulbs that will then feed into a model. And um, his ecological zone model uses 
um, the uh, program maximum entropy and inputs over 20 um, you know, landscape variables uh, such as elevation aspect, uh, annual precipitation, uh, slope, uh, geology, um, curvature, distance from streams, lots of different things. And, and it puts those known vegetation points uh, and intersects it with all those layers and then maximum entropy uh, predicts the unknown portions of the landscape based on the known portions of the landscape. And so that's how we're, we're that's the tool we're using to define uh, ecosystem boundaries in this analysis. And on the north zone of Cherokee National Forest, you know, here's a colorful map of, of what those ecozones look like. And uh, this is a view of the Nolichucky River Valley around the town of Irwin. Um, and I, I use this because this is the same presentation I, I gave at the uh, Southern Blue Ridge Fire Learning Network conference, and some of our field trips were in this area. But basically, um, all of the red areas on this map are yellow pine forests, and the brown and lighter greens are oak forests, and the blues are those moist cove forests, um, while the yellow in the valley bottoms are floodplains that are mostly agriculturalized at this point, uh, very few of those on public land. And I do think it's important to talk about all the ecosystems we have in the southern Blue Ridge just from a communication standpoint because it's a very uh, complex uh, region of the of the country ecologically, and there's a lot of, um, you know, frankly, a lot of concern from the public about fire. We have a lot of uh, negative public uh, opinions about fire, and I think a lot of folks uh, are concerned when they hear about public land managers using fire that they're not using fire in the right way. And so I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that we have all these other ecosystems like spruce fir forest that we don't ever want to burn. Uh, there's no uh, research on the natural fire return intervals of spruce fir forest, but uh, a lot of people, have, a lot of um, knowledgeable scientists have, have estimated it's over 1,000 years, maybe 10,000 years for a fire return interval in spruce fir forest in southern Appalachians. Um, and these, these are, you know, very lush green places uh, on the tops of the mountains above 5,000 feet. Um, they're adjacent oftentimes to northern hardwoods forests that are also very moist and don't have much in the way of uh, fire adapted species and probably burn very infrequently. And uh, other moist forests we have are things like acidic cove forests that are dominated by rhododendron and have uh, eastern hemlock as an important component. Um, and rich cove forest uh, that is, you know, oftentimes on north facing slopes and in very curved uh, positions along uh, streams that. Uh, you know, very concave slopes that concentrate moisture, and these likewise don't burn very frequently and are not priorities for burning uh, for local fire managers. Um, once you start getting into the oak forest, it becomes, you know, there's more and more scientific evidence that fire is important. Uh, the biggest enigma are the northern red oak dominated forests, including high elevation northern red oak and mesic oak forests that have a lot of northern red oak component. But as you get into uh, the dry music oak hickory forests that have a large white oak component along with various red oaks and hickories, it's clear that fire is important. And this is a, a, a photo of a spot on Cherokee National Forest that has had some wildfire and it's doing great, uh, really benefiting from the fire scene. Um, dry oak forest is another uh, ecosystem that clearly benefits from fire, uh, oftentimes dominated by chestnut oak and scarlet oak with some amount of pitch pine and maybe Table Mountain Pine mix again in small amounts. But um, most of these forests are very choked in these days with evergreen heath like mountain laurel. And fire is what uh, allows sunlight to get into this, uh, into the mid-story, to the understory of this forest, regenerate the oaks, and also maintain the herba herbaceous community. And this is, again, another place, uh, this time on Pisgah National Forest, that's seen some wildfire. And you can see the Appalachian hill cane and other native herbs responding to that. Uh, low elevation pine forest is, a, is uh, the home of the shortleaf pine, which is a subject of a lot of conservation concern and definitely benefits from fire. Uh, most of the shortleaf pine forest out there today is closed canopy forest, and this is one that Cherokee National Forest is actively uh, burning, and it's, uh, it's looking better than it did prior to the fire. And then um, another yellow pine forest is uh, pine oak heath, which is table mountain pine, pitch pine, and also various heath species such as blueberries, huckleberries, mountain laurel, um, and a number of herbaceous species as well. Most of these uh, forests are highly degraded from a lack of fire. Uh, this is one that has had some wildfire and is very open 
There's very few places like this currently on the landscape in the Southern Blue Ridge. Um, and so uh, those are our priority vegetation types for, for fire management. Uh, they're the yellow pine forest, like pine oak heath and low elevation pine forest, and the oak forest, like dry music oak, uh, music oak, and, uh, and dry oak. Where, and we're definitely not trying to burn spruce fir, northern, northern hardwoods, or cove forests in, um, in the southern Blue Ridge, even though cove forests do occur inside of our prescribed fire areas, uh, most of the time they do not burn at all. The fire just goes out before it even gets into those cove forests. Because we were looking at the entire Cherokee National Forest and because we wanted to make the study as random as possible, we, um, we, we could have done a, a few things, but we chose what we chose to do is to use the UTM grid to break up Cherokee National Forest into uh, into over 2,000 grid cells, um, and the UTM grid is just another uh, you know geographic datum, just like latitude longitude. It's a way to navigate, um, but it's based on uh, square kilometer grid cells, and that translates to about 247 acres. That's the smallest area we we're looking at. It was about 247 acres. Um, and we were prioritizing those areas by forest type, fire history, um, and habitat type, which in this case was um, areas that had uh, been regenerated because of either wildfire or prescribed fire. Also, we looked at rare species and rare community acres. Um, and the model designers wanted the, the model to be most responsive to ecosystem type, but also sensitive to those other factors. And so a number of the components were area-based in their scoring. And the area-based components are basically the forest types and then that habitat type of young forest that was regenerated by fire. Um, and the reason that we only looked at fire-regenerated acres was beca is because that uh, acres regenerated by silviculture, there's concern that fire will damage the economic quality of those trees uh, in the future, whereas those fire regeneration ar areas uh, most times makes sense that um, continued fire will not damage any future economic interests in, in the timber harvest or anything like that. Uh, so we looked at yellow pine forest, which uh, scores the highest. So just the acreage of a yellow pine forest would be the score. So since the, a grid cell in our analysis was 247 acres, there's a potential maximum score of 247 just for yellow pine forest. And uh, in comparison, dry oak forest is only three quarters of its total acreage. And dry music oak forest was a half of its total acreage, and Montana oak forest was a quarter of its total acreage. Uh, regeneration acres was a, would be a double count because it would be superimposed where it occurs on all of those forest types and uh, uh, is scored as half of the total acres of regeneration. And the reason we chose to score those forest types differently is based on our understanding of the state of, of fire science uh, as it relates to historical fire return intervals in the Southern Blue Ridge. Um, there's uh, been several studies in the past 15 years about fire return intervals in the Southern uh, Appalachians by um, Aldrich, LaFond, Grissima Meyer, uh, Flatley, and other researchers. And universally, those yellow pine forests, whether they be dominated by shortleaf pine or table mountain pine or pitch pine, have fire return intervals between uh, three and seven years on average. Those are the mean fire return intervals. Whereas oak forests range from nine to less than 35 years in the literature. And so there's a lot more variability inside the oak forest. Um, and it, you know, if you take, um, if you take that variability, we, we just made some assumptions. Basically, the yellow pine forests burn three times more frequently than those m moist oak forests, the Montana oak forests, and twice as frequent as the dry music oak forest and 50% more than dry oak forest. So th 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 that was an assumption we made and we tried to base that assumption based on our understanding of the fire science. Uh, we also had a current space scoring which uh, was much uh, less influential over the prioritization model than those area-based scores. Uh, we attempted to have all of the current space scores be roughly equivalent to each other in their potential maximum. Uh, because we didn't want any one of those to outweigh the others, and we also wanted them to be less important um, in their influence than uh, the area-based scores. Uh, 
so we looked at wildfire occurrence, and the reason we looked at wildfire occurrence is because um, it turns out that wildfires do occur more than once in the same place. And on Cherokee National Forest, uh, there's a combination of things. Some places receive more lightning, uh, much more frequently though some places seem to be more frequent targets for arsonists. And um, so we wanted to take that into consideration because those, those places are most likely to continue burning. We'd probably rather have those uh, burn under a prescribed fire scenario than a wildfire scenario. Um, we also looked at where shortleaf uh, pine forest occurred based on U.S. Forest Service stand data. Uh, we looked at uh, management area 9F, which are rare communities on the Cherokee National Forest. It's a whole management area for rare communities. It's only about 2% of the forest, and we looked at the subset of those that had uh, fire-dependent rare communities like Table Mountain Pine Forest or uh, rocky glades that benefit from fire, et cetera. Um, and then we looked at rare species. In this case, we only had three of those um, that we, we looked at, and we gave five points for occurrence, which was conveniently, uh, there was no more than five occurrences in any one of the grids that we looked at, so a maximum score of 25 for that. Those three species are, um, are the uh, Hamamelis, oh, I'm blanking on the scientific name of this. Um, it's, um, it's a fire-dependent shrub species here in the Blue Ridge. It's not necessarily rare in other parts of the country, but there's really good scientific literature showing it benefits from fire. Uh, the Thermopsis raxinifolia, the ash leaf golden banner, it's a legume that uh, definitely benefits from fire and has good literature demonstrating that. And then uh, turkey beard, uh, Xerophyllum asphalidoides. And um, so we had a pretty conservative um, list of, species, of rare species that benefit from fire. Uh, mainly because Cherokee National Forest staff, uh, the staff botanist, wanted to limit it to, to species that he had very good uh, documentation um, that, that they directly benefited from fire. And here is how the different model components scored uh, when we actually ran the analysis. Um, those yellow pine ecozones that include um, Pine Oak Heath and low elevation pine forests were the highest scoring of any of them, um, had up to 162 points in a given polygon. Um, moving down the list, dry oak forest expectedly was next. Uh, dry music oak forest was third. And then um, regeneration from fire was actually ahead of montane oak ecozones and their influence over the model. Um, and wildfire history, shortleaf pine, rare species, and rare communities all had a potential influence that was roughly equivalent, as I explained previously. Now here's a look at the entire uh, north zone of Cherokee National Forest, um, stretching out along the North Carolina state line. On the south is Smoky Mountains National Park, and on the north is uh, Virginia and the Jefferson National Forest. Uh, many of the ridges in this part of the Blue Ridge uh, have a shape much like they do in the Ridge and Valley where they run very linearly um, southwest and northeast. Uh, but they were uplifted, and very similar rock type also, but uplifted earlier than the Ridge and Valley mountains were and tend to get higher rainfall also. Um, one thing, strong pattern you'll notice is that there are a lot more of the high scoring polygons to the western side of Cherokee National Forest and more of the low scoring polygons to the eastern side, and that is due entirely to elevation. Um, the lower elevation, drier sites are to the west side, and the higher elevation, more mesic, moist sites are on the eastern side of Cherokee National Forest along the state line, with, with uh, some elevations going up to over 6,000 feet at Roan Mountain. So um, just looking down here on the south, in case any of you are real familiar with Cherokee National Forest, uh, along the French Broad River Valley, um, you know, that pattern holds real strongly, but there are even some, some fairly high scoring areas um, along the state line in that section. Um, that pattern of uh, lower scoring areas along the state line becomes more prominent as you move north in Cherokee National Forest. And this is uh, around the Nolichucky River Valley and uh, around the Watauga Reservoir. And then uh, in the far north, um, Holston and Iron Mountain both have a lot of fire-adapted vegetation on those. 
And here's a look at where the current prescribed fire units lay on the landscape. So you can see that many of them occur in areas that uh, are high priorities for fire, but you can also see that there are some areas that are very high priority that lay out outside of uh, current prescribed fire units. And uh, here's the south half and a similar pattern there. Um, there's good coverage of prescribed fire units, but there's some very high priority areas that are outside of uh, prescribed fire units. And we can zoom in here um, on the very southern end of the Cherokee National Forest and look at Stone Mountain. Um, this area here has not had a prescribed fire, but did have a wildfire this year that burned about 2,000 acres. So maybe this is a priority for a new uh, prescribed fire unit in the future as uh, Cherokee National Forest uh, does more planning. The basic results are that out of 2,300 grid cells analyzed, uh, the mean score was 64 with a maximum score of 266. Um, the top quintile of scores was over 112, and the second quintile was greater than 80. Um, and as I mentioned, the top scoring grid cells clustered towards low elevation and southern aspects. Um, hopefully, this, this model will be useful for Cherokee National Forest in identifying uh, new fire units on the North Zone. Um, we would actually like to refine this model because as we went back and, and, and truthed it with the knowledgeable uh, folks of Cherokee National Forest and, and different stakeholders, we noticed that there were some areas like uh, there's a mountain called White Rocks Mountain that's very steep and very south facing and has a lot of fire activity and didn't score very high. And it turns out it's because um, the, the distance from the base of the mountain to the top of the mountain is less than a half a kilometer very steep, and so it was actually washed, it, the importance of, of, of that area for fire ecology is washed out by the shape of the analysis units and their size. So smaller units, we would like to go down to probably a quarter kilometer, uh, square kilometer um, grid cells, and, and it seems like that would be doable on a pretty, uh, pretty average uh, GIS computer. Uh, wouldn't need a supercomputer or anything to quadruple the number of um, the number of polygons we analyzed. So I think we'd like to try to do that. We'd also try to like to uh, try to prioritize the south zone of Cherokee National Forest because ecozone uh, mapping is almost complete for that area, and uh, it'd be a great tool for the south zone to have as well, and to have uh, Cherokee National Forest having a, a consistent uh, analysis tool for the for the entire forest. And I would definitely like to thank uh, all the following people and more. Um, Catherine Medlock especially uh, did a lot of work to facilitate several meetings of this group of folks uh, that gave their input and their time to uh, determine what our priorities were for, for prescribed fire on the Cherokee National Forest. Um, included in this list are at least eight different organizations and a lot of different interests. And it's uh, really, uh, really powerful and, and helpful to have so many different folks helping out with, a, with an exercise like this. And um, that's all I have for this presentation and I'd, um, Welcome, any questions folks have? Hey Josh, this is Mark Healy, how you doing? Hey Mark, doing well, how you doing? Doing great. Hey, thanks for your work on this, this was outstanding, really appreciate and it. Thanks, thanks for thanks your work on this too, you were a key uh, contributor. So this is a, this is a pretty simplistic prioritization scheme. There's a lot more complex ones out there, um, and that's one of the reasons I like it. Is I think just about anybody could copy this methodology um, if they have the appropriate GIS, uh, you know, GIS layers to do it. Um, Josh, we've lost your slides. Oh, would you like them back up there? How about I put them back there? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, Josh, this is this is Catherine, and one of the things I wanted to, um, I guess, comment on, or and, and certainly you can talk more about this than I can, but um, you know, my experience with this is that, uh, you know, the group 
kind of help to decide what the priorities were and how they would be prioritized. Um, you know, and um, and that was um, for this effort. I think um, we did a lot of. Um, we, we, I think we were conservative and we, and we focused a lot on um, what was available in the literature. Um, but, um, but certainly um, if th this as a tool, because it is um, pretty, uh, you know, you can set your own priorities with it. Um, someone who, like say on the South Zone or somewhere else, if they wanted to, um, you know, look at look at this with a different lens. Um, that would certainly be um, be an option. There's no kind of standard. Uh, you know, the, I guess what I'm saying is the prioritization scheme that we used is not a, a standardized scheme that would be the same everywhere. That's exactly right. Yeah, and and different versions of EcoMath have used all in the Southern Blue Ridge have used all sorts of different ways to um, to prioritize and especially to weight and scale different units. In some landscapes where there's not as large of an acreage, for instance, um, there were efforts to uh, go for the greatest density within each unit, not necessarily, you know, acreage was less important as, as much as the density that occurred within each unit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then that's, that was what the approach taken on the South Mountains, for instance. Um, but yeah, it really is up to the folks who are active um, in managing the, the landscape and the active stakeholders in, in public lands in the area uh, for something like this. And it was really, really great to have folks from, you know, uh, wildlife, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, like John Gregory, and uh, have the fire shop from Cherokee National Forest and the rangers and um, and the silviculturalists and botanists and you know wildlife biologists and uh, and leadership from the forest and you know the wilderness society and the southern environmental law center and uh, Cherokee Forest Voices and all the other you know Bill Burris from um, uh, from the timber interests there um, you know all talking about these shared priorities and coming up with something that everybody could uh, could get behind I I think there's a lot of value in that and and just a, a lot of knowledge too and trying to uh, blend all those disciplines and interests is, uh, uh, I think it's really powerful. Yeah, trust this is Margaret. I think you're hitting on an absolutely, you know, key point because your discussions on the priorities, they just help people understand then, you know, how this whole picture of the landscape fits together and why the Forest Service or state parks or national parks, you know, is trying to burn something. Um, I think the latest uh, version of the model is currently available in draft in our Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment and um, South Carolina state parks, you know, has found this very interesting and they're in the process of figuring out as they're bringing fire back to South Carolina, where that should go, and they've sort of, you know, taken what what you've given them and made a, a first cut at it, and they're seeking more um, stakeholder input in that. So, I think your sort of bigger landscape approach and looking, you know, outside of burn units, I think that's a really nice way and novel approach on EcoMath version 2, so thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, unless there's any other, um, you know, burning questions, I, I propose that uh, we adjourn this webinar or any other business we need to conduct. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, all of the support from the Southern Blue Ridge Fire Learning Network and Cherokee National Forest and Nature Conservancy and, like I said, all the other participants who donated their time uh, and knowledge to this effort. And uh, one last thing, I guess, then, um, Lynn, will you send out a um, uh, the recording of this so that we can uh, we can share that around with um, with folks who might not have been able to to participate. Yeah, I'll figure out how to do that. We've got a new system going here. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> thank you for thank for thank you for for braving the way. 